webinar about mindfulness and self-compassion. Living in a turbulent, stressful, noisy and uncertain world that is marked by conflicts, violation of basic human and children rights, prejudices, our mental health threatened on a daily basis. We all know the shocking figures of the number of young people who have serious mental problems. The challenges today's generation of young people face are unique and extremely hard to navigate. The effect of these challenges have had on their mental health destructive and overwhelming. Fortunately, there has been a worldwide increase in attention for the importance of mindfulness. Studies suggest that mindfulness practices may help people to manage stress, to cope with serious illness and reduce anxiety and depression. Mindfulness and self-compassion work closely together. We need mindfulness to be self-compassionate and self-compassion gives us the sense of safety needed to be mindful. There is a balance needed in cultivating both mindfulness and compassion with wisdom and skill. We are extremely happy and honored to have two great speakers who are going to share their wisdom and skills tonight, and I'm delighted to announce their presence. Most welcome to both Susan Bogels and Karin Bloom. Susan Bogels, you are a professor in family mental health, in particular the role of mindfulness at the University of Amsterdam. You are a psychotherapist and a mindfulness trainer for both children and parents and companies. Susan, you are going to share your thoughts inside systemic mindfulness. Susan, the floor is yours, or maybe I should say the screen is yours. Thank you very mu much, Vitka, for this uh, kind and also beautiful introduction about the team of uh, today. And it's a great honor for me to present here for so many of you. Um, it's also a great honor for me to present here together with Karen Bluth and meet her for the first time in real. And I'm really looking forward to this evening together. Um, I would like to start with uh, reflecting a moment based on our own experience on what mindful mindfulness actually is. So if you kind of sit back, take a comfortable position, perhaps closing your eyes, Noticing your posture, what you're sitting on. Connecting to this body, this breath, this moment. And then when you're ready, Going back in your mind's eyes to the day of today and finding the most mindful moment you had today. So just searching through your day, what was my most mindful moment today? And if several come up, just choose one. And look at that moment. Where were you? What was happening? Were you alone or were there others? Can you remember how you felt inside? The 
far to our around. Your emotional tone, what was happening in the body. Perhaps you remember sounds or images. smells, taste. So what sensory experiences were around? And what made this moment mindful? Was it a sense of joy or connection or stillness? And then coming, letting go of that moment, coming back to here sitting here in front of the screen and gently opening your eyes again. And so if we weren't such a big group, I would ask all of you to kind of put in the chat something about this mindful moment. For example, the question, was it a moment alone? So was it a personal mindful moment or was it an impersonal, an interpersonal mindful moment? And I would be so curious if we would count our experience of this around thousand people here, how many of you would have come with a personal or with an interpersonal uh, moment or maybe both. And so I think this shows us how interpersonal mindfulness actually is. And perhaps some of you don't even know what the word mindfulness means. So we come to that in a minute, but I think everybody has a sense of uh, what we're looking for in our day, if we're thinking about those mindful moments. And maybe for some of you, this moment of sitting here was actually the most mindful moment. So when I started um, learning mindfulness, it was back in 2000, so long ago, um, when I did actually, I was, uh, when I was learning mindfulness, I was already also teaching it. So I was, um, I plan to teach adolescents at our mental health care institute, what's called Riach Maastricht at the time. Uh, and. I planned to provide mindfulness for a group of adolescents with severe externalizing disorders. So they had ADHD or autism or behavior disorder or conduct disorder or a combination of all of them. And many had two or three of those diagnoses. And I had a last minute intuition to um, also include their parents in that training. And the reason was it was very funny. I was working past a bookshop, an esoteric bookshop, and I saw a book with a title Mindful Parenting. It was, I think it was out for a couple of years, but I never heard about the word mindful parenting. So I looked at the book, the book was of John and Myla Kabat-Zinn. I had heard of John Kabat-Zinn by then. And so I think it was the first time I bought a book in an esoteric bookshop. And I thought, yes, let's give these parents mindful parenting while giving the adolescents a mindfulness training. And the parents were very surprised that they also needed to come because they thought this training was for the kids, but because the kids had severe attention problems that go together with these type of conditions. But I convinced them that they had to come and most of them came, at least one of the parents or one of the professional caregivers if the children were under that type of care. And so we had for the first time ever, we had parallel 
uh, mindfulness group for youth and mindful parenting groups for their parents. So they often came together, they went together, and I was amazed what I saw happening there because they were separate, but yet they were connected because they were both following mindfulness. There were moments where they came together and it really seemed something magic seemed to go on there in the midst of this uh, suffering of these families. And many parents afterwards said, I wish I had this training before, before things run out so much of hand in our families. So that's when we started to do mindfulness also with younger, with kids age 8 to 12, with certain conditions that were still working in mental health care. So we were focused on kids with conditions. And then um, we went even younger. So um, one of my colleagues went to do mindfulness with parents and babies and toddlers. And finally, we even um, did the program on mindfulness in pregnancy for so for pregnant couples. So what I'm going to do with you today is um, go with you through my journey in mindfulness and families, which started uh, 22 years ago. And so I'm going to present, uh, and I'll probably talk a little bit faster to do that, the research over the last 22 years in this, um, yeah, this adventure that uh, started then in 2000 on mindfulness in uh, families and that's why I'm calling it mindfulness now in the life cycle of families. So I'm now going to share my screen. So this is a picture of um, Saskia van der Oort and me when we were doing our first mindfulness um, group uh, with kids with ADHD. These are kids of uh, age 7 to 12 and I still remember that first time we did it together and Saskia said afterwards to me, she had to run uh, hundreds of um, cognitive behavior therapy groups with children. And she said, Suzanne, something new is happening here. This is really important. And that helped uh, us to continue. So mindfulness in the life cycles of families or systemic mindfulness. But so let's come back first to a definition of what mindfulness is. This is the definition of John Kabat-Zinn. Mindfulness is the awareness that emerges from paying attention on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally, or at least postponing judgment or looking beyond the first judgment to things as they are. And if you're going to apply that on um, mindfulness interpersonal, interpersonally, then uh, there are many definitions of that. One I found is interpersonal mindfulness is the awareness of self and others accompanied with the qualities of non-judgmental and non-reactive presence. So it's awareness of the self and of the others uh, and of course, also uh, awareness of what is happening between the two of you. And uh, Prachadal came with a more extended definition of interpersonal uh, mindfulness, but it comes back to the same thing. It's this receptive awareness in an interpersonal context of self and others at the same time. So as Vitika already said, these are stressful times. Um, to the left, a graph of um, the research team by Twench showing that in less than 10 years time in the United States, this was just before COVID, uh, depression had doubled and the same was true for stress and for anxiety and sadly also for uh, succeeded suicide. And if you look at the age range of those groups, uh, you can see that this increase in depression is solely caused by the younger age group. So 18 to 12 to 17 and 18 to 25. Whereas we kind of stay um, 
it, it stays similar for us, but for them it doesn't. And we don't know why that is. And if you look now at the pandemic, and there was a report of the World Health Organization recently um, showing that anxiety, depression has increased by 25% in the pandemic, in the first pandemic year, I think it was, while mental health is going down. And again, they, sh they found that looking at worldwide research, uh, those incre the, the increase is particularly the case in young people and uh, sadly also particularly in girls. So there is something going on. These are stressful times. And so I think it's not for nothing that it's, uh, it's been the young people who stood up, uh, for example, to fight climate, um, the, the climate crisis, to ask attention for that. It were the young people, here you see young people in India, this is pre-COVID. These are kids who walk with masks and demonstrate for clean air because the kids suffer more than adults do from the toxic air where um, we are being exposed to. Actually, 90% of our kids are exposed to too toxic air. And of course, more things are going on. Look at the screen use. What does it do to our family life? Um, climate change, a picture of climate change in a wealthy country, but let alone what climate change does to families in um, uh, countries of lower welfare. And the picture on the right is a picture um, of um, the Berlin Wall when it fell. This was at a moment when my son was born 33 years ago. And I'm thinking about parents and about children when I was raising my kids, it was in a period of hope. There was, the, the world was opening. And now we're in a period where in many ways, the, the world seems to close or seems to polarize. So there's a lot going on. And I think it's not for nothing that it's really the youth that are most affected by it. So what can we do? And I cite Zen master, Thich Nhat Hanh, by bringing peace and happiness to our own family, we bring peace and happiness to the world. And so by starting close in, we can make a change. And by practicing mindfulness, we realize we are connected. When I sit on my cushion after a busy day, and uh, take a moment for myself to meditate, then suddenly things come in my mind like, oh, when is the birthday, the 29, 92 birthday of my mother? This kind of social thought simply by uh, withdrawing myself from the social world, really going inside, I connect to the world around me in a different way. And this, this is the, the gesture of the Buddha showing that we are all connected. And so interbeing, I find this a beautiful term, it's the Buddhistic idea that by living in the present moment, the interdependence nature of all beings is experienced. And so this is how we come to relational mindfulness, because we know that mindfulness influences the way we relate to our own mental and physical conditions and can actually cure them. But it also um, influences the way we relate to others. And so by practicing conscious present moment and non-judgmental attention with ourselves and with other people, profound changes in our relationships may occur. And perhaps even in the health and the well-being of family members. So, one of the most important things I think we all have to learn in this life is to regulate ourselves. And I put self between brackets because um, in a way there is no self. We are all connected. We just think we have this self and this ego and that is actually the cause of many problems. 
but we have to regulate emotions, arousal, attention, behavior in order to function healthy and adaptively. And that self-regulation is, is primarily relational. We learn to regulate ourselves in the relationship with other people. And that starts, of course, in the relationships with our parents when we are young. So when an infant has a tantrum and the parents sit there stable, non-moved, uh, sitting with a toddler to, so that the toddler ca can really have his tantrum, that's where he learns to regulate his emotions. So it really begins in infancy. And so there are a couple of um, uh, concepts that are very helpful when we think about self-regulation and mindfulness in families. So first, the concept of synchrony. Uh, the emotional arousal, attention and behavior activation in one family me member results in similar activation in other family members. And of course, this doesn't happen only in families. It happens also on the work floor. But let's start with a family. This is where we see this happen. And the word co-regulation also a very well known concept in helping uh, families is the interactive process of regularity support in caring relationships across the lifespan. Originally, we thought about co-regulation as something that happens between a mother and a baby, but it's actually happening across a whole lifespan as, as I will later uh, show. And so this synchrony, this co-regulation is the reason why um, mindfulness for family members or for whole families is such a easy target, such a, a fruitful target. And so I also like to say here something about the capture, about the concept of rupture and repair, which came from Dan Siegel in, from his beautiful book that he wrote, um, starting with the, the title is Parenting from the Inside Out, a very wise title. And he um, very convincingly demonstrates how as soon as our physical arousal um, heightens, as it does in any conflict, partner conflicts, work conflicts, parent-child conflicts, sibling conflicts, any conflicts of physical arousal heightens. And as a result of that, the, we tend to take a short route because as soon as we're physically aroused, we are in a state of threat and then our evolutionary brain immediately brings us in a short route where we can uh, very fast put our motor system in action to either fight, flight or freeze, which is very helpful in a life-threatening, a life and death situation but not very helpful in some of the conflicts we have with our loved ones. But still that happens. And so our physical arousal and uh, the resulting behavior actually hinders uh, the way, the, the things we need to solve our conflicts and to deepen our relationships with our families, because in conflicts, we can really deepen our relationships. And so, we have to calm that physical arousal in order to be able to come back to this interpersonal mindfulness where we can sense ourselves, but we can also sense the other people, where we can take the perspective, where, where we can see our own perspective and the perspective of others. And that's the precondition to solve any conflict. So what I'd like to go two with you is several perspectives on sy systemic mindfulness, mindfulness in families, the partner perspective, the parenting perspective, the mother with a baby or toddler perspective, a pregnant woman with her partner perspective, the child, adolescent and their parents perspective, adult children's perspective, and finally, the therapist perspective. 
So starting with uh, a partner's perspective, together with Lisa Emerson, we reviewed in 2019 uh, the literature on this. And we found that there was actually a lot of evidence that when one person in a partner relationship is mindful, that predicts and is associated with better relationship satisfaction for the couple and a better relationship functioning. So one person in the, in the partner relationship can actually make a difference for that relationship. And also a study showed that um, individual mindfulness in, in women predicts greater relationship stability. So the stability, the relationship stays longer together when the women are more mindfulness. Why that is the case with the woman and not the man, I don't know, but uh, it's a fascinating finding because it was a longitudinal study. And also this is a study from the research group of Larissa Duncan in the US. Uh, sorry, that's another uh, study. Sorry, no, this is another um, research group of chemists and colleagues where um, they found, they studied um, partners during a conflict and they found that if one individual in the partner in, in the partner couple is more mindful, that leads to lower cardiovascular activity in the partner. So this is exactly what we mean with co-regulation. And I was thinking about Larissa Duncan's research uh, with mothers and infants that shows exactly the same, that when the mothers are more mindful in their parenting, um, the baby's um, cardiovascular activity is better regulated in a conflict, in a context of high stress. So, but now let's move on to the part parenting perspective. Let's first say a little bit about parent stress because research has shown that Adult stress, so when we adults are stressed, that's the primary predictor of child stress. Not only of parent perceived child stress, but also of child reported stress. So it really matters how stressed we are as adults when we are parents. And so we know that any mindfulness training will help adults to lower the general stress levels through awareness of their stress and through the meditation and by applying breathing spaces and self-compassion when under acute forms of stress. However, if we now look at mind mindful parenting and stress, the situation becomes a bit more complex, but also more interesting because what happens um, under stress in families? Um, first, children can have a lot of stress as we've already seen and so parents become aware of the stress of the children and need to take care of them but of course through this synchrony when the child is stressed the parents also become stressed and as a result is less able to take care of the child so what they need to do is and that's so this interpersonal mindfulness of being aware of self and the child they need to be aware of the child and at the same time they need to be aware of their own stress it they may have life stress in general they may have parenting stress they may have partnering stress or it may simply be the effect of the child's stress on the parent's stress level and so they need to take care of themselves in order to not get into this overreactive of overprotective parenting, not to become angry with the child, not to overprotect the child, to give the right pr protection, the right distance, the right autonomy, the right care. They need to take care of their own stress. And then there's a third level of stress, and that's the child inside us because we have external children if we are parents but we also carry a child in ourselves. we are not only an adult we are also a child actually uh, a saying is when you get a child you not only become parent you also become child again so we have all an inner child 
and need to take care of that. For example, if our child is having a tantrum, throws himself on the floor, absolutely unable to deal with. And we, when we were children, weren't allowed to be angry and throw ourselves on the floor. We may actually feel some rejection or jealousy or automatically repeat what our parents did with us. So our inner child also needs to be taken care of in situations of stress or high emotions. And that's um, kind of one hand for the child, one hand for the self, and also one hand for the child, for the child in ourselves. That's parenting ourselves. So after this introduction on mindful parenting, I want to show you some effects of mindful parenting training. This is an eight week training that I developed already 20 years ago for our parents. It's a standalone training. So it's a training only for parents, eight week, two to three hours where they go, go to a general mindfulness program with mindful parenting added upon that. And we did a whole range of studies on uh, this program. And um, here on this graph, you see the effects that the program had. This is the weightless phase. This is the eight weeks where the parents follow the mindful parenting training. And this is the follow up phase. And this was a first study of 90 parents with who were referred to mental health care because their pro children had mental health disorders or they themselves had mental health disorders that got in the way of their parenting. And what you can see is that through the mindful parenting training and the children got no treatment at that point, the internalizing and externalizing problems of the children went substantially down. And not on, only the, pro the problems of the children, but also parents' own internalizing and externalizing problems went down. So the research shows that indeed mindfulness for one member of the family, which is the father or the mother or both, has a spillover effect on other members of the family, which is the target child with the problems. So to summarize, all these studies, so we found substantial effects on parenting stress, on overreactive parenting, on the parent-child relationship, and also on what we call co-parenting, um, parenting together. Even when you disagree on things to, for the child, show that you're a team. Uh, we found substantial effects here on parental and child psychopathology, as you see in these graphs, also, we found that improved mindful parenting mediated a better child income, so if outcome, so if the parents become more mindful, the children get less psychopathology. Um, yeah, and this is just an explanation of what you see in the graphs. So that's the mindful parenting perspective. Now let's look at um, the baby and toddler perspective. Eva Potthards, who is here on this uh, picture, further developed the mindful parenting training into a mindful parenting training, training for mothers with their baby's presence or their toddler presence. And these babies or toddlers were there for a reason. They had problems like intense crying, feet problems. Uh, so they came, mothers were referred because there was a, a, a problem. And so she found also in a series of studies, substantial improvement of this training on mother's mindfulness, her mindful parenting, parental stress, and her psychopathology up to a year later. Also the observed parenting of mothers improved. So mothers became compared to a waitlist group and the observers were blind whether the mothers had the mindful with your baby training or the control were in the control group, the mothers became more responsive to their babies, more accepting, less non-attuned, and also the babies became more responsive. So they make, made more vocal sounds to the mother. They got more space in a way from the mothers to respond. And um, substantial improvement was found on positive 
affectivity of the baby. So the baby smiled more, but not on negative emotionality. So the babies didn't cry less. And so I said in, in one of her groups, and it was really wonderful to see her work with the moms and meditate with the moms when the babies were simply enjoying themselves, playing together or playing on their own. And you could also see in that group how the babies were also in a way trained by the meditation bell. So as soon as the meditation bell went and the mothers would start a meditation, the babies would stop um, you know, trying to get the attention of the mothers and start to play or do things together. And of course, in the training like that with babies, there always need to be a second pair of eyes, or not a meditation teacher, but uh, a mental, um, an infant mental health expert who would keep an eye on the babies and keep them safe in the room. So, now going to um, systemic mindfulness in an even earlier phase, namely in the phase of uh, pregnant mothers. And Irena Veringa here on this picture, she, she's a mindfulness trainer, a midwife, um, and, a, and a researcher of this study. She will do her PhD um, in uh, January on this. And uh, she did a randomized trial where uh, she selected uh, pregnant women with um, a high fear of childbirth and that high fear of childbirth actually strongly predicts all kind of maladaptive uh, 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 childbirth processes. So fear of childbirth is a very, it's kind of the top of the ice a mountain. It's really, it indicates a lot of problem that need, problems that need uh, to have attention also, for example, psychopathology in the mother or relational problems. And so she selected this group of women with fear of strong fear of childbirth and randomized them together with their partners to either the mindfulness-based childbirthing and parenting program developed by Nancy Bardeke in the US. And she came here to train us in it. And Irena compared it to enhanced care as usual for um, uh, fearful pregnant moms. And the care as enhanced care of usual was a series of individual consults with a couple in how to deal with um, the fear of the mother. So um, what she found was that um, First, and you see that on the left on this graph, first um, she found that um, uh, the group who had the mindfulness training had lower fear of childbirth. So lower fear in the pregnancy, also lower uh, fear of a second childbirth after, after birth. So definitely uh, they were less fearful. But more important, uh, their birth outcomes were better. So they had less cesarean sections, they had less unneeded uh, medical interventions like pain medications. So the birth outcome, the birth process was better and also the babies had a better APCAR score just after birth, but not any longer five minutes after birth. But so this is very important news. So it shows that when women with their partners practice mindfulness, they really can make a difference for the childbirthing process and even for the condition of the baby just after birth. Um, we also wanted to know what effect this mindfulness program would have on the partners. And we found that partners who are at risk, so the partners who were having mental health uh, problems or lower mental well-being before the training, uh, they improved more through the mindfulness um, training than compared to the treatment, the, the enhanced care as usual. And finally, mediation research showed that it was indeed the higher mindful awareness of the mothers that mediated that better birth outcomes. So not the lowering in fear of childbirth, but really 
being more mindful, more aware. So now move on to uh, the child and adolescent perspective. Um, we also developed a pro program, it's called My Mind, and it's a program uh, where I told you for, uh, about in the beginning, we do it with children 8 to 12 and with adolescents 12 to 18. Uh, it's specifically developed for children with a certain condition like ADHD, uh, autism or conduct problems. And uh, these children go into mindfulness groups themselves, groups of one and a half hour, and their parents go into parallel mindful parenting groups. So it's the same program still as uh, in that sense as we did uh, 22 years ago, parallel groups of children and parents. And so in all our research, we're looking at the effects on children, on the parents, and on what is going on between the children and the parents. Uh, so mostly they meditate separate in, in their separate groups, but sometimes they come together to meditate together so that they can also see the progress in each other and interact with each other. And so um, a series of study, and I'm just going to give a very brief summary, uh, but basically all these studies show that uh, the program gives improvement in the attention problems and other psychopathology in the children and in their parents. And for example, if you have a child who is referred with ADHD to a clinic, chances are 60% that one of the parents also has a similar condition. So there is a, there is a genetic link in ADHD um, uh, through which when it makes sense for parents of children with ADHD to meditate because if they have similar attention problems, it may help them too. It may help them in their attention problems, in their hyperactivity, in their impulsivity. So it may help them uh, for their own lives, but also for parenting uh, their kids. So that's why I think is when wh why we see this improvement in both the children and their parents, and moreover, parents become less stressed, less overreactive, and more mindful in their parenting. Here you see a graph. This is the waitlist period. The outcome measure is here. The attention problems of the children. Uh, there is no difference in the waitlist problem. Here, the children and their parents get the the mindfulness training, and the attention problems of the children substantially go down and there is further improvement in the eight week follow up and also the, at the long term follow up, the attention problems are still better than what they were before. So when we talk about co-regulation as uh, we started with in the, with the beginning, uh, here's a very interesting finding on co-regulation from one of the studies we did on children with ADHD. So this was a study where we had 160 plus um, children with ADHD and one of the parents of both parents in the parallel mindful parenting training. So, and we looked in this study in first how these children improved in their attention problems, how the parents improved in their own attention problems and both improved. But then we wanted to know what predicts improvements in children. So is there anything that can predict which children improve more than other children? And we, we looked at all kinds of things, uh, gender, age, whether they had ADD or ADHD, uh, and found no results. So the only result we found was on fathers and actually on fathers with ADHD. So we found that when fathers have ADHD or are above a cut, cut off point of ADHD, their children improve more. And that's what you see here. Here's the waitlist period. The green line are the children of the fathers with ADHD. This is their improvement. 
from in the eight weeks of the mindfulness training. And these are the children of fathers without ADHD. They start lower, but they also improve less. And at a follow-up, this is still a little bit the case. And at a one-year follow-up, not any longer. But so we wanted to know why is this that children of fathers with ADHD improve more. And then we did a whole series of mediation analysis. And then we found that if fathers have ADHD, they're twice as likely to follow the Parallel Mindful Parenting program. Apparently, they see there's something there to learn for, for them. And um, this interaction uh, is, was caused by father's lowering of his own attention and hyperactivity problems. So it's a clear case of co-regulation. If fathers learn to regulate their own attention and hyperactivity and impulsivity, their children do better. So for the live fi last five minutes, I want to show you a little bit of the qualitative research that we've been uh, doing on this program, because it shows so interestingly how, um, uh, how interpersonal mindfulness takes place in families. So this is qualitative research from the research group of Nijmegen, from Nienke Siebeling et al, um, where um, we had trainers, parents and children being interviewed on um, the qualitative effects of the training. And then trainers say things like that parents and children were co-teachers for each other. Uh, the support and involvement of the partner, quality time together, developing a mutual language, insight and empathy for each other's emotions. So the trainers came with a lot of interpersonal effects of the mindfulness. Parents also said things like, I became aware of my critical view of the child. I became more accepting. I have a warmer relationship with my child. The conversations improve, less conflicts. And also feeling supported by the group. Children said things like, aware of the effects of my ADHD behavior on others and vice versa. So we did the same in the My Mind program for autism. This is, you can read the paper. It's a, also a beautiful qualitative stu study, but I just zoom in a moment to attuning to others, which is one of the aspects that came out of this qualitative study. So parents say things like, you really have a moment together. We also talk about it sometimes how she, my daughter, is doing, what she is feeling. That's quite different for her. Also because she has autism, but with mindfulness, for example, the wedding report exercise, this is a meditation where the children and the parents have to feel the inner weather and then also uh, say it aloud afterwards. This exercise is very useful for her to feel how she's doing and with labeling it with a type of weather, you can talk about it. That helps her to express herself about how she's feeling. And I think this makes you being closer because I better know what goes on in her head. So I think this is a beautiful description of interpersonal mindfulness. So it's a lifelong perspective. I won't go into this in detail any longer, but children are not they are grown up at 18, but they still need their parents' care, and especially those children with certain conditions. And this is where mindfulness for parents and children can work too. It also works for therapists. If we are more mindful as therapists, that has all kinds of effects on the people we work with. And so to conclude, mindfulness targeting one mem family member does affect family relations and other families' well-being. Co-regulation, uh, modeling attunement, overriding with automatic responses may all explain this effect, including other families in mindfulness, whether it's in the same or parallel training, appears beneficial, 
but of course controlled research is needed on this. And finally, bringing mindfulness to families is a lifelong journey. These are the people I want to thank. Um, and I end with uh, my website where you can find a lot more information about family mindfulness um, and also uh, a new uh, teacher training that we're starting end of March on mindfulness in the life cycle of family families. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Suzanne. Um, I feel I have the need to let it go down. Um, but I can also see on my other screen that during your uh, lecture, people already raised some questions. So I would like to share some of them and to hear your reflection on it. You just ended and you say, said, um, bringing mindfulness to the family is a lifetime journey. We had a question about um, how long does a child be in the mindfulness training, a child with high activity, how, how much time is needed before really, before the, 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 the problems substantially go down? It's a very, very good question. And actually we don't know that yet. There is a lot of research going on now on how long mindfulness programs should be. Can they be shorter, shorter in sessions, shorter in hours? Can it be on the computer? Can it be without homework? And there is a lot of promising research that short meditations can help too. Uh, and actually for children with ADHD, you have to be short. So our programs are eight times one and a half hour plus a follow up eight weeks later. That's what we, we give them homework. They have to do it. If they don't do it, they don't earn points. Uh, so we have a whole system in place to help them meditate and the parents help them meditate. And the parents do amazingly well because it's not easy to help a child with ADHD to meditate and the children do am amazingly well. They love the yoga. So they do some homework. They come to the sessions, they love the sessions, but we, we don't know if we could also get the effect with shorter than eight weeks, or if the effects would be stronger if we would go on longer. But I think the, the child, the life of a child is short. They grow so fast. And so for them, eight weeks is quite a long period. So in that sense, I feel that the eight week period is good for these children not too long then afterwards they can go to the football training again or whatever they're doing uh, but a lot more research is needed on this also on the question of whether they need to continue to meditate some parents okay. tell me when when the children don't meditate anymore the effect is gone but that's not we we just don't know okay okay thank you then another question is from someone who is asking whether the combination of medication and mindfulness will, whether it will lead to better results. Do you know anything about this? Yes, we, in, in the first pilot I did with this 160 plus um, children with ADHD about it, this was the open pilot. You can find it in the literature about half of the children was on medication. So we, we could study uh, the effects, not randomized, but we, we could study how um, uh, the training worked for those with and without medication. It worked for both groups. The group on medication, funny enough, had higher ADHD symptoms to begin with, but they decreased it just as in the group without medication. I think the clinical answer here is if they use medication and want to try mindfulness, um, if they want to stop medication to try mindfulness, that's fine. If they want to continue, that's fine too. And what you often see is that during the mindfulness program, they want to reduce the dose a little bit. And sometimes when I see children that I find too medicated in the mindfulness training, I may even say to the therapist or the parent or the psychiatrist, uh, perhaps their doses should go a little bit down because they're not hyper enough because you need to have some material to work with. Yeah.
But so yes, you can do with and without and combine it. And, and we need more controlled research on the combination of the two, whether that's better or not. And, and thank you, uh, Susan. And, and another question. You talked about um, the relationship with, with pregnant women doing mindfulness during their pregnancy. And you said that uh, the birth, it was more calm. And also that uh, a few seconds after, a few minutes after the birth, you could see the results. But afterwards? Yes, so the, um, we need to do more longitudinal um, study on those babies later. But unfortunately, uh, because of ethical concerns, we offered um, uh, the, the families also the mindful with your baby training, also the ones who didn't have the mindfulness in pregnancy because they were randomized either for man mindfulness or for the uh, enhanced care as usual. So I think it was around six months that we offered the whole group the possibility to, to do the mindful with your baby training. So we don't have a clean group where we can do follow up data on mind on the babies on mindfulness versus no mindfulness. Mm -hmm. That's a pity. But um, just go to the literature, look at v uh, Irena Veringa's studies and you'll find a lot of details around the effects of this uh, program and i was um yeah i i was very impressed with the pro with, with with the effects that it had yes and i think it may also actually it may keep the parents together because um i think the divorce rate is is very high when parents uh first child is one year of age and actually, I think a mindfulness program during pregnancy may help parents go through that difficult phase in partnering when they have a young baby. So I hope to see yes. more research there also on the yes. relationship. Yes. Yeah. There's another question, maybe a little bit related to this. I think there has a lot of been a lot of research been done, done on that. But maybe you could uh, give a short answer. Uh, do you have any knowledge of the impact of stress during the pregnancy on children? Yeah, that, that's, I'm not the most knowledgeable person uh, on that, but there is a whole uh, literature out there on the effect of the stress of the mother, but also stress and depression of the father on the unborn uh, child and it's yeah. there's, there's research called pre-programming that actually when the mother is very stressed it prepares the baby for um, a stressful world which is very helpful if for example uh, for example the holocaust when mothers were were pregnant in in a disaster like that it's very helpful to prepare the baby for a threatening world but um, if the world is not threatening, the stress of the mother may be uh, less helpful for the child. So, yeah, but yes. there is a, just study the literature. It's a yeah. very important uh, uh, area of research. Yes. Susan, thank you. Due to the little constraints we had, we have to um, stop now and enter into the, the break. Um, it's a 10 minutes break. We will start again at 2020. But you are going to stay with us, Susan. Um, after the break, we will start with um, Karen Bluth with her lecture. And at the end, we will also have the three of us a conversation. So after 10 minutes, we will be back again. <laughs> 